The topic given to me today is the gospel as a foundation of ministry, based on Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, which Yvonne uh, read for us. But before we look to the word, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word that is alive. Your word that in the hands of your spirit is able to speak, convict, teach, encourage, rebuke, and bring about in us, your people, that transformation that you desire. And so, Father, our prayer is that as we look into your word this evening, you will help us to hear your spirit speak by your word. And not just hear, Lord, but hear what you have to say to each of us. For you know us. And you know exactly what we need to hear from you. And so speak, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Paul, when he wrote to Titus, he had left his young disciple, his mentee, on the island of Crete. Because the church in Crete needed to get straightened out. There were a lot of issues going on and Paul couldn't stay on. And so he left Titus there and said, and wrote this letter to Titus, guiding him to, to know what to do in order to help the church in Crete be the people of God they were meant to be. And the problem in the, in the new churches on, on Crete was that there was a gap between the truth of the gospel they professed and the way they were living. It didn't match. They professed one thing, but their lives didn't match that which they professed. And this gap was basically caused by a selfishness, a self-centeredness, an attitude that said, me first. And when you think about it, it's not that different from today, isn't it? We live in a very me-centered society. We live in a society that is focused on getting what I want. And yet, the gospel of Jesus Christ is meant, us to, lead, meant to lead us out of that me-centeredness to become other-centered. Out of that selfishness to become self-giving, isn't it? But then you might ask, why is it important that we who profess the Christian faith should live a self-denying, self-giving kind of life? And Paul deals with this issue, with this question, head on in these verses. And so he says in verse 11, chapter 2, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now note that word for at the beginning. Paul is giving the reason for 
and spelling out the logic behind Christian living. And he's saying the main motivation for living a self-giving, other-centered life is the grace of God. He tells us in verse 11, grace saves us. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. What is grace? I came across this illustration of grace taken from David Seaman's book, Healing Grace. A poor farmer went to see his bank manager. And he said to the bank manager, I have got some good news and some bad news. Which do you want to hear first? And the banker replied that they had better get the bad news over with first. Well, said the farmer, I've had such a bad year that I can't pay the mortgage I owe you on my house. The banker looked disgruntled. There's more, said the farmer. I've had such a bad year that I can't, I've had such a bad harvest that I can't repay any of the money I borrowed from you to buy new machinery either. That's bad, replied the banker. I'm afraid there's more, said the farmer. Last year, I also borrowed money from you to buy seeds and fertilizer and other things. And I've had such a bad time that I can't even repay that to you. That's terrible, replied the banker. You had better tell me the good news now. <laughs> well, the good news, said the farmer, is that I still intend to do business with you. <laughs> now, how does this illustrate grace, you may ask? Well, God's grace is that despite our spiritual bankruptcy before Him, because of our sin, because of our rebellion, because of our waywardness, because of our living our own way, despite all of that, God still wants to do business with us. God's heart of compassion and mercy to us even in our failure, even in our sin, is still for us. He still loves us and desires to be in relationship with us in spite of our repeated failures, weaknesses, sin, and rebellion and that is grace because we don't deserve any of it and now in verse 11 Paul speaks of the grace of God appearing he says for the grace of God has appeared and he is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ because in Jesus Christ the fullness of God's grace has been made visible and so it can be said that grace has appeared to us when Christ came in his first coming. Grace was revealed to us through Christ's entire life on earth because Jesus Christ is grace. But Paul says not only has God's grace appeared in Christ Jesus, it has brought salvation for all people. His grace is not restricted. It is offered and made available to everyone in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not so in the Old Testament. But with Jesus Christ, that offer has been made to all. Think of the Gospels. Think of the Gospels and the people in the Gospels to whom grace would not normally have been extended, and yet how Jesus Christ went to reach out to them. Think of the lepers and the outcasts in society. 
Think of the demon-possessed man who lived among the tombs and whom Jesus sought out. Think of the cheating tax collector like Zacchaeus. Think of how Jesus went out of his way to find these people and receive them and bring salvation to them. The grace of God reaches to all, to Mary the prostitute and Mary the virgin, to Peter the fisherman and to Paul the Pharisee. It is available to everyone who chooses to accept it. No matter what your background, no matter what your past, no matter how big or small your sin is, no matter how much you messed up in life, God's grace is open to you. Whoever you are, God loves you and sent his son so that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. God's grace saves us. But God's grace doesn't only save us. Paul goes on to tell us that grace, God's grace trains us, teaches us. He says in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Usually when we think of grace, we think of that saving moment, saving grace. We think of grace only in relation to the start of our Christian journey. And we tend to forget that God's grace is still available every day, every moment, to help us through the rest of our journey. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace makes it possible for us to live in a God-honoring way. The grace of God is our teacher, our trainer in the way of godly living. How does the grace do that? Paul goes on to tell us. He says, first, grace teaches us to say no to certain things. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Here the term ungodliness simply refers to everything that is contrary to God's will. It's the opposite of godliness, which is everything that pleases God. And the term worldly passions is a contrast to heavenly desires. And so we have to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. We have to say no to everything that takes our focus away from God. Worldly passions. Worldly passions help us focus on the world. Ungodliness helps us focus on everything that is contrary to God's will. And we have to do this. It's, it's a moment by moment thing, isn't it? It's not something we do once and for all and it's done with. It's something we have to do every day, isn't it? Every day. We have to say no to something and to everything that takes us away from what God desires for us. We have to say no to every sinful desire that comes into our minds and tries to tempt us. Now, while grace teaches us to say no, it also tells us there are things we need to say yes to. Paul goes on in verse 12, training us to say, to renounce ungodliness, but also to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now, Paul mentions here three virtues, self-control, uprightness, and godliness. And some commentators see in these three virtues are three fundamental human relationships. Self-control, how we relate to ourselves. 
how we control ourselves. Uprightness focuses on how we relate to other people, doing right to others, treating others rightly. And godliness focuses on our relationship to God. Because godliness is only possible through a relationship with God that results in a life honoring to God. And then he says, we are to live like this in this present age. Now, when he says this present age, it implies that there is a future age, isn't it? There is a future. Non-Christians will say, oh, this life is all that there is. So, you make the most of this life, you live it to the hilt, enjoy every pleasure you can, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There's nothing to look forward to. They will say life is too short, so enjoy and make the most of it. But the Christian is someone who is waiting for a future that we anticipate, isn't it? This life we know is not all there is. And hence, self-control. Self-control has to do with delayed gratification. The postponing of immediate gratification. Now this is something that's very, very difficult for children and teenagers to understand. Delayed gratification. And it's very difficult for many of us adults too, isn't it? But when we know there is a future, we can say no to pleasures of the present. When we know this present age is transitory, it's passing, it, it will end. But there is a far greater reward for us in the future. We can say no to things of this present world. Grace trains us to live in anticipation of that future. And that's what Paul says in verse 13. He says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the Christian is someone who looks beyond this life to that blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Christian who is someone who lives between the times. Yes, the grace of God has appeared in Christ Jesus, but the glory of God is yet to appear at his second coming. We live in the already, but not yet. And there is a tension. There is a definite sense in which this hope can be experienced to some extent even now. There is peace which the Holy Spirit can bring to us even in the midst of life's trials and challenges and pain. The grace of God and the Spirit of God enables us to experience something of Christ's presence even now. But the fullness of that peace and joy and healing and presence of Christ is still in the future. And that's where the Christian has the tension. We've experienced something of it which causes us to long for the fullness of it. But we have to wait. And so we don't live Life with an attitude of let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. No, we live life now in preparation for that future. And so even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of unanswered prayer, even in the midst of sickness, terminal sickness, there is hope. There is a future. There is more than what there is in this present age. And this motivates us to live the right sort of life now. Because one day, you and I will meet our Savior face to face. And so I'd like to leave with you some questions. <clears throat> 
I like you to ask yourself, have we lost the ability to say no? Are we losing the ability to say no? And we need to honestly evaluate our inner compulsions. What drives us? What motivates us? What controls us? No one can answer that for you. Francis Schaeffer, in his book, True Spirituality, he said something very important. He said, we are surrounded by a world that says no to nothing. We have a society that holds itself back from nothing. Any concept of a real no is avoided as much as possible. Absolutes of any kind, ethical principles, everything given to influence and selfish personal peace. Now, if this was true when he wrote this, some years back, I think it's even more true today in the present. And we live in this kind of environment, isn't it? It's, it's, it's very difficult to say no to anything, especially to anything that is selfish or self-centered. And if anyone says no to something and, and puts an absolute standard, for instance, on social media, you get quite a strong backlash. Because it's a no-no in our society today. Have we lost the ability to say no? And secondly, I'd like to ask also, have we lost the willingness to say yes? Yes to God. Yes to live in a godly life. Because it means sacrifice. It means giving up certain things. But why is that important? Paul, in, his, in this letter, he had, he had earlier reminded Titus that older men are to set an example for other believers. Older women are to be reverent so that they can teach the younger women. And Titus himself was told to be an example to others. The Christian life does not function independently, isn't it? We are part of a community. And our actions, our decisions need to be considered in light of their effect upon others. No man is an island. And you and I need to ask ourselves, am I willing to deny myself something, even something legitimate, so that I can help someone else? Because every time we want to help someone else, it will involve saying no to something that we might hold precious. Time, personal space, convenience, it costs. And it's, and it's not easy. And so what could motivate us to live like this? Paul has the answer. He says, love for him who gave himself up for us. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for us, for himself a people, for his own possession. Zealous to do good works. Now note the order. We are first redeemed from all lawlessness. That's the first step. Then Christ purifies us for his own. And then we can be zealous for good works. And it's that unconditional love and grace of God towards us that should motivate us to an uncompromising commitment to godliness and good works. When you and I have experienced God's grace, knowing full well that we did not deserve any of it, when you and I have experienced God's favor upon our lives, when you and I know we have not done anything to earn it, <laughs> 
grace is what Paul says must motivate us and remind us to live for him. Who is Christ? What has he done for us? Paul says he gave himself for us. He was not forced to. He didn't have to. But he gladly gave himself up for us. And it is that that which should motivate us for good works. To live a self-controlled, upright and godly life. And so as the, the topic that was given to me says, the gospel is the foundation for ministry. I'd like to end with a true story. It happened some years back. I don't know how many of you know the story of Captain Bly and the bounty, his ship, and what happened. In 1787, Captain Bly and his ship, the bounty, uh, had been in Tahiti, an island paradise in the Pacific. And then they left Tahiti to sail back to England with his crew. But one morning, uh, Captain Bly woke up to find himself facing a mutiny from his crew. The crew was so captivated with the sin and leisure and pleasure of the Pacific Islands, they wanted to sail back to Tahiti. And so they did. And in Tahiti, they persuaded some of the women to come with them. And they set out again from that island and they came to the island of Pitcairn, which seemed like another earthly paradise for them. When they arrived at Pitcairn, they took all they could from the ship and set it on fire and sunk it so that no passing ship would know that they were there. They didn't want anyone else to discover them. And then they let loose all their passions. They simply lived as they pleased. They were free to do whatever they wished. They began to make alcohol from the plants that grew on that island. And the men spent days, weeks, completely drunk. Soon fighting and killing broke out. Ungodliness reigned. Eventually, there were only two of the mutineers left. One man was named Edward Young, and the other was Alexander Smith. Now, Young was quite elderly, so remember, Young was old. And he became ill. But these two men persisted in their wayward behavior. Now, one day, Young found the ships, uh, the old ships, the Bounty's Bible. Smith couldn't read, but strangely, in one of their most sober moments, rare moments, Young began to teach Smith to read the Bible. And they started to learn, reading the Bible through from Genesis. And little by little, they saw that God is holy and that they were sinners. And the reading of the Bible began to affect them. They realized that their lives were an offense to God and they began to change slowly. And the children on the island were the first to notice the change. Now, not too long afterwards, Young died. Remember, Young was old, so Young died. But Smith read on and by now he had learned to read for himself. And he came to the New Testament. And something remarkable happened to him as he read about Jesus. And this is what he wrote of his experience. He said, and I quote, Suddenly it was as if the doors flew wide open and I saw the light and I met God and the burden of my sin rolled away and I found new life. From that moment on, everything on Pitcairn Island changed. 
Smith began to read the Bible to the women and the children. And 18 years after the original mutiny, a ship from Boston came across Pitcairn Island. The captain came ashore. And there he found a community of people who were godly and gracious. They had a love and a peace about them which the captain had never seen before. The grace of God had saved them and the grace of God had educated and trained them. It had redeemed them from the wickedness and made them into a people eager to do good. And what the gospel did there, the gospel has been doing everywhere it has been preached. And the gospel is able to still do that by God's grace. Anywhere and for anyone. Let us pray. Lord, as sometimes as those who have grown up in the church, been in the church for many, many years, heard the gospel many, many times. Lord, sometimes we confess that wonder of the gospel, the wonder of your grace. simply by familiarity has grown dim. And I pray, Lord, for myself and I pray for every dear sister and brother here that by your Spirit, Lord, you will again kindle within our hearts that wonder about your grace and the gospel. That, Lord, again, we might be captivated by your love and your mercy. And that, Lord, as we, as we are more and more captivated, Lord, you might grow the desire within our hearts to live lives that honor you and please you. And as we do that, Lord, as you bring about that transformation in each of us, and as a community, Lord, may that become the basis of our ministry. May others see that difference. May others notice that difference. So that, Lord, what we profess in our mouths, by our word, and how we live may match. And people may be drawn to you. That is our prayer, Lord. That is our desire, Lord. Would you do it by your spirit? For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.